uh, relatively minor technical difficulties, it is our huge pleasure to welcome you all to Brasilia, our HG Buzz Digest of the World Congress on Huntington's Disease 2013, coming to you live here in Rio de Janeiro and streamed to thousands of people across the world by the magic of the internet. My name is Ed Wild. I am the English one, as you can tell from my ridiculous outfit. Um, I've just proved that consignments of great fruit, so it's all going very well. Um, I'm a clinical neurologist and an HD researcher at University College of London. Um, and with Jeff here, I've co-founded HD Buzz, uh, an internet news source for the global HD community. My name is Jeff Carroll. I feel like I just got a round of applause from Nancy Wexler. That was fabulous. Uh, I'm the American one. I'm a Huntington's disease researcher, as well as being the co-founder of HD Buzz, uh, as well as being an HD professional. I'm also an HD uh, family member. Um, <laughs> do you know the you know that dream you have when you're a kid and you go to school in your underwear? <laughs> I think that's what just happened to us. So from here on out, it's going to be all smooth sailing. <sighs> when Ed and I started HD Buzz, we had the goal of opening up the process of scientific research to the HD community. What you're seeing tonight is part of that process. Each night we're going to put together a little presentation at the end of the day uh, to hopefully that captures some of the excitement from this meeting uh, and bring it to families at home. They're going to watch online uh, and uh, be able to experience what it is to be at something like the World Congress, the largest gathering of Huntington's disease patients and professionals in the world. Unfortunately, we can't pipe them the Rio sunshine. So um, each night we're going to briefly recap some of the exciting events from the day. Uh, as well as bringing some very lucky uh, scientists up on stage to talk about their research and hopefully make it more accessible to the global community watching. Um, we'll also be having a little bit of fun uh, after a long, intense day of science um, and uh, pay close attention because a very small number of people on stage are going to win what can only be described as the world's most exclusive hat, the HD Buzz baseball cap. <laughs> Damn straight. Uh, we'd like to start by thanking you. Uh, this room is part of an experiment, which is to try and bring a sense of what this meeting is about uh, to people at home. So thanks uh, for your participation as well. Okay, so let's make a start. It's been a long day, even though it's been a short day. We're all exhausted. People are jet-lagged, people are thirsty, people are, some people are a little bit grouchy. <laughs> um, so um, what we'd like to do is get the blood flowing a little bit um, so that we, you can all stay awake for the next few minutes. Uh, we did think about getting everyone to stand up and do a samba dance. Rio de Janeiro, of course, the home of or Brazil, the home of samba dancing. We thought that might breach health and safety regulations as well as being even more embarrassing than we need it to be. So instead, we're going to liven up those tired old chakras, loosen the bandas, and uh, get the juices flowing with a bit of very straightforward yoga. Okay? Yeah. I'm sensing a little unease. We'll be doing one yoga pose, yoga position, every night. We're going to start tonight with an extremely straightforward one, which I like to call Uttanasana, the forward bend. This pose is excellent for rejuvenating after a long day of science and particularly livens up the pancreas. So this is going to be suitable for everyone, whether you're a wheelchair user or you run a marathon every day. Standing up is optional, so if you wish to stand up, please stand up now. If you'd rather stay seated, suit yourself. So the main thing, as I'm sure you all know, the main thing about yoga, okay, uptake is slowly improving on that one. Peer pressure is working. This is a metaphor for Huntington's disease clinical trial recruitment. Everybody wants someone else to go first. Okay, I think those who are going to stand up have done so. So the, first, the most important thing about yoga, of course, as we know, is the breathing. We're going to do yogic breaths. What that means basically is shut your mouth and breathe deeply and gently in and out through your nose. Become aware of your breath. Become one with your breath. Feel the breath invigorating each and every one of your lungs. <laughs> okay, so this is a forward bend, but the first thing we're going to do is look up and reach up. Another metaphor for Huntington's disease research. Looking up and reaching up. Look to the ceiling. And now we're going to gently fold down without straining ourselves or breaching any regulations and reach towards our toes. Yoga is not a competition. There is no winner. What is right for you is your personal victory. And now we will straighten up. And while you were bending down, Jeff took a photo of you, which he's going to tweet to two and a half thousand followers of the HD BuzzFeed. 
It does. <laughs> Give yourselves a yogic round of applause. In yoga, everyone is a winner. I've always wanted to tweet from on stage. Um, okay, so let's move on to something a little bit sciencey. Uh, what I said about the pancreas is not true, by the way, if any, in case anyone's taking notes. Um, so what we want to do, because this is the first day of the conference, the last conference was two years ago in Melbourne, Australia. We wanted to step back a little, take a bit of an overview, figure out where we are, why we're here, where we're going, and then we'll, as the, as the sessions go on, we'll fill, we'll fill in with some specifics. So what we want to do is start with five big reasons to have hope. If you're a family member or if you're someone affected by Huntington's disease. Ed and I spend a lot of time talking to patient groups around the world, uh, trying to spread something we call substantive hope which is not the hope that they, you know, it's always they are working on Huntington's disease, they're working on developing treatments, but real people in real labs are working hard around the clock trying to develop therapies for this disease. So we want to share with you our personally picked from many top five reasons for being hopeful about Huntington's disease now. So the first one is a slightly controversial statement, but I've, uh, I've said this many times at patient family meetings and I've, so far I've never been lynched. Um, Huntington's disease, in my mind, and Jeff kind of agrees, right, is the most curable, incurable brain disorder. What I mean by that is that because we know what genetic mutation causes Huntington's disease, we know exactly what the problem is. Everyone with HD has the same basic genetic mutation. Everyone with that mutation will get Huntington's disease unless we can do something about it. What that gives us is a, an opportunity that many other diseases don't have. Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease, they don't know, in the vast majority of cases, what causes that disease in a particular person. In Huntington's disease, we know that we have to sort out this mutation, sort out the protein that it produces, and that will work in treating Huntington's disease. So it is incurable, but we in the HD research community believe that it should be curable if we can work hard enough together. Next, the global community of HD organizations, both research and patient focus. These organizations are local, as we've heard about today, helping people in specific regions and countries, but global and networking to share information uh, that will help uh, not only the care of Huntington's patients, but ultimately to develop the trials uh, that will lead to effective therapies for Huntington's disease. Um, I don't know if you people know this, but organizing scientists is kind of a thankless task. They tend to be uh, an independent bunch, uh, and the infrastructure has been established with these networks. It's gone a long way towards making this uh, work more effectively. The third big reason to have hope is something I call the golden window of opportunity. The basic idea here is that someone with the genetic mutation that causes Huntington's, unless we can do something about it, will get signs of the disease or symptoms of the disease at some point. Symptom onset, you could call that. We know that that's associated with a mixture of neurons in the brain that are struggling, they're unhappy, but they're not dead, and later on in the disease, those neurons die prematurely. In this window where the neurons are struggling but not dying, that's the, that's the golden window where we believe that we can intervene to keep those neurons happy and make things a little bit easier for them. Um, and the availability of the genetic test means that we can study people and hopefully when we have treatments, we can hopefully treat people before symptom onset and push that symptom onset later. And hopefully we can do that a little bit at first and then more and more and hopefully make an impact on this disease. Having symptoms doesn't mean it's too late. Patients often ask, if I'm already symptomatic, can these treatments that you're talking about developing have any uh, impact on my disease? Now, of course, we don't know the answer to this until we run definitive clinical trials, but we think there's good scientific reasons for having hope. In particular, a, a relatively old at this stage experiment that uh, w was done with a bit of genetic trickery in which a mouse was born with a mutant copy of an HD gene, which of course, like people, makes it sick. So the mouse is born with this gene, it gets sick. Uh, what we can do in mice, but not people, is have a genetic trick that lets us now turn that gene off. So we made the mouse sick, like an HD patient in some ways, and then we turn off the gene. Well, what happens? Well, not only do they stop getting sicker, they seem to get better, almost as if all the brain needed was a break from the onslaught of toxicity from this mutant gene, and we just need to give it a little holiday. And in that holiday, the brain, at least in mice, seems capable of, of healing itself. So we think there's a good reason to believe that we could help somebody's brain, even if they were symptomatic. And our final big reason to have hope is a slightly philosophical one. Um, I, I like to think of science as being a bit like a glacier, or if you're English, a glacier. And you can laugh at whichever one of those you like. Um, 
with the glacier, snowflakes fall on top of a mountain. And no one snowflake makes a big difference. But over the years and over the decades, they are compacted together into this huge structure that can literally move mountains. And science is the same. Not only can science move mountains if we try hard enough, we also know that the snowflakes are falling all the time. Every day we know a bit more than we did the day before. And when half the world's scientists are asleep, the other half are awake and working on Huntington's disease. So having given you our five big reasons to have hope, what's happened in the past two years? The last World Congress was two years ago. What are some notable advances that have happened? We've chosen just a, a tiny handful from lots and lots of things that we could have mentioned, and we'll certainly hear about more this week. We think there's a lot to be optimistic about. One big advance in the last two years has been the advance of so-called gene silencing as a therapy for HD. It's a remarkable technology that basically lets you turn off any particular gene you want. So because all this bad stuff in Huntington's disease patients happens because of this mutant gene, which we know, as Ed said, getting rid of that gene is a pretty attractive idea as a therapy. Everything bad that happens in HD stems from that gene. If we could just turn it off. Um, this year, um, uh, gene silencing has been advancing um, uh, rapidly over the last decade. This year, Isis Pharmaceuticals published uh, the results of a safety trial in familial ALS, another neurodegenerative disease, showing that they could infuse similar silencing drugs to the ones we'll need in Huntington's disease into the central nervous system of patients with no adverse events. That's a huge finding. It opens up the pathway to the brain. And in case you think that's too academic and too remote from Huntington's disease, get this. Um, earlier this year, uh, the massive drug company Roche announced that they were investing in Isis uh, and their Huntington's disease gene silencing program to the tune of $32 million immediate investment and up to $360 million more to, for the final push to bring these drugs to a clinical trial. This was our reaction when we heard that news, and we suggest that you react similarly. This year, the final major publications from Track HD were published, uh, an observational study of, of human HD mutation carriers, and the PREDICT HD study continued its work observing people who carry the HD mutation but don't yet have symptoms. Some of those people have been observed for over 10 years now. Um, this kind of data is critical to planning good clinical trials. No one now can say we're not ready to run clinical trials on HD. Because of these studies, we know so much about how this disease process uh, progresses in people. This is something that we've heard a little bit about today. Um, there's actually a spelling mistake on this slide, which will become <laughs> very ironic in a few minutes. <laughs> Um, so, uh, we heard a little bit about phosphodiesterase inhibitors. Um, these are drugs which uh, affect the working of a molecular machine which crunches up signaling molecules. Um, and we, we believe that that may be helpful uh, for making the brain work better in Huntington's disease. Um, earlier on, CHDI and Pfizer, uh, who are working together, announced some really encouraging results which we'll be hearing about shortly. Um, and at least two other companies are, inter are developing uh, drugs that do something similar. So not only do we have big drug companies working on Huntington's disease, but they're also, in some cases, racing to the finish line to try and perfect their drugs and test them, um, which is great news. Another uh, exciting piece of news this year uh, was that a longtime Huntington's disease researcher and incidentally my science dad, um, Michael Hayden, shown here in full Rio mode, which I'm sure he appreciates, uh, had joined Teva Pharmaceuticals, a major pharmaceutical company where he's their head of research. So now, of course, Teva is a large pharmaceutical company. They work on a number of diseases. But one of the first things they announced once Michael joined them was uh, the acquisition of a very advanced HD drug candidate. So, so nobody can say we don't have friends in pharma anymore. OK, so those are our, that's our five big reasons to have hope. A few exciting things. As I said, there's many more. And we'll hear more about them as the week goes on and, and new stuff that we can't even begin to imagine yet. Um, Let's move on to our interview section. So tonight, we're going to interview a couple of uh, researchers who have given talks during the day. We want to chat to them about their work for the benefit of people in the audience and those at home. So our first interviewee is Dr. Nacho, Dr. Ignacio Munoz San Juan, who was here earlier. Oh, oh. oh that's bad news. We'll, we'll make up a little time, though. Unfortunately, the uh, drug developer is unwell. <laughs> he has taken to his bed. Which is a shame, because I wanted to share with you guys that we, everyone calls him Nacho. Um, so what we will do move on to, uh... is move on to our next interviewee. <laughs> what I want to mention, though, uh, which, is in, which is going to be a pretty exciting news, is that during his talk, I think there was a, a slight gasp of astonishment, because a lot of us have been following these phosphodiesterase inhibitors. 
that CHDI is working on. Um, the idea of them is that they improve the communication between brain cells, which is not working so well in HD. Um, we heard exciting results earlier in the year at the CHDI conference. What Nacho announced today was that with uh, Pfizer uh, and their collaborators in Europe, CHDI is hoping to begin a phase two clinical trial of their phosphodiesterase inhibitor drug, the drug um, uh, hopefully before the end of this year, so late 2013 or early 2014. This is a program that's moving on really rapidly, and I think that's really encouraging news. I'm pretty sure that's what Nacho would have said, but in a much more manly voice than yes. I could possibly ever muster. He's, he's such a manly man, I can't even begin to impersonate. I know that's difficult to imagine. But. Okay, so we'll then move on to our sole interviewee. So uh, please uh, join me in welcoming uh, Professor Elena Cataneo from the University of Milan. Uh, Elena, you get the whole couch to yourself. You should feel free to recline. The uh, highlight of this interview is that Ed has to give his mic to Elena, so now we can all uh, enjoy our peaceful evening. <laughs> so thank you for agreeing to be our guinea pig. Thank you for agreeing to talk about your work with uh, the Huntington gene uh, in ways hopefully that people at home can understand. So today you were talking about the Huntington gene in not just mice and flies and worms, but it, or people but in a range of organisms. Just, just what kind of organisms have Huntington? What's the oldest organism that has a Huntington gene? Uh, the most uh, ancient uh, organism is uh, an amoeba. It is called, uh, the name is uh, Dictyostelium discoideum, and it is uh, the first uh, pluricellular organism that uh, has appeared. And, uh, and of course, uh, when the gene was born in, in this uh, species, uh, was born uh, with no CAG repeat. Uh, but the gene is there. What's a, what's a CAG repeat? Who gave that man a microphone? <laughs> it's just a series of letters that uh, appear in the gene. But uh, based on these uh, studies that have been conducted by people in this audience, we know that... Uh, when the gene was born, and this was 800 million years ago. 800 million years ago. That was when the Huntington gene first appeared. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it was basically born with no CAG, so these letters were not there. And, uh, and the other thing that is very interesting is that uh, this uh, species is the first uh, pluricellular organism. What's a pluricellular organism? It's an, an organism composed by multiple cells together. They have to talk to each other. Before this organism, we have unicellular organisms like yeast. Mm -hmm. So they are individual cells. And these individual cells do not have Huntington. Then you have the first pluricellular organism, which is this amoeba, the Justilian discoideum. And this species, this amoeba, has the Huntington gene. But the gene is there in an innocent form with no, no CAG repeats. And, uh, so it's only when the cells got social, in a way, when social. they started sticking together, that they had to have a Huntington gene. Yeah. So maybe, I mean, we should think of this idea about, uh, uh, of the gene being a social gene. So a good gene, I would say, from the beginning, at the beginning of the evolution. So the gene was born with no CAG repeats. And then, as you know, evolution uh, uh, basically uh, developing two different branches. One is the protostom branch, and for example, insects belong to the protostom branch. The other is the deuterostom branch, and we belong to the deuterostom branch. And, uh, and we know that, of course, the, the gene, I mean, was passed to the other species, but then only in the deuterostom branch the CAG has appeared. So, so from the amoeba onwards, every organism has, every animal has Huntington, but in the branch of animals that contains flies and insects, they have Huntington but no CAG. Exactly. In the branch that contains people, CAGs start to appear. Exactly. So this is why we should think at these letters that suddenly appear in the gene as a, an acquisition of the deuterostom branch. And this acquisition 
was not there just by chance, I mean, in one species and then disappeared. It has remained there. And this is, I think, uh, telling us something very so, important. So it's useful in some way. It is there. Exactly. So wh when the CAG appears in the deuterostom branch, in the first species, which is C. Urchi, the incredible thing is that uh, this CAG repeats, and they first appear in two CAG repeats. Searching, hunting team has two CAG repeats. These CAG repeats are positioned exactly in the same, at the same position where the CAG is in my gene. So it's not a random in the genome, in the gene, sorry. So they appear, just a few, couple in searching, very good to eat, but it's also, <laughs> it's also, this is also the first species that has a very primitive nervous system. So this is another message. Of course, we're dreaming you know, because we like, I mean, to dream and to imagine how things can be. And then you go to the lab to verify whether this is wrong or not, or, or, whether this is true or not. So we, we are thinking that maybe, I mean, the appearance of the CAG in, un, in searching Huntington probably has uh, instructed the appearance of the first elements of a very primitive nervous system. And then this CAG repeats didn't disappear, I mean, in the subsequent species, in the, in the other species. So they remained there. And, and the incredible thing is that uh, they kept growing in number. So you have more evolved species of species with a more evolved, more complex nervous system have a progressively higher number of CAG repeats. And this is very progressive. It's not sudden. No? And this is uh, just amazing. And, and as we know, Huntington's disease happens in people when there are more than the regular number of CAG repeats. So everyone has two copies of the HD gene. And someone who's going to get Huntington's disease will have a larger number than usual of CAG repeats. So this thing that's been growing and growing over millions and millions of years in people who have Huntington's or who are going to get it, it sounds like that process of growing has just gone a little bit too far. Something that, something that was really useful and seems to be doing something really good because it's growing over evolutionary time seems to have just gone a little bit further than is healthy, right? Um, yeah, um, but I think, uh, I mean, the first message, again, maybe this is just philosophical, no, but the first uh, message is uh, that we can extract, I mean, from this information is that um, the CAG repeat is part of our evolution. And it is something important. And uh, patients belong to this evolution too. So they're not something aside. And uh, yeah, why, I mean, this good process in some way, I mean, got too far away. I mean, uh, of course, we don't know, but uh, uh, I mean, there are data even, I mean, also from Michael Aiden suggesting, and also from other colleagues, uh, really showing that even in normal people, evolution keeps pushing toward more CAG repeats and more CAG repeats. So we know that we are polymorphic, normal subject for that gene are polymorphic. So we're the gene. Just to stop you for a second. Yeah. When you say we're polymorphic, polymorphic, you mean we have a range of different CAG repeat lengths? I would say. We, we had the gene with different flavors of CAG repeats. So I can have 10, you can have 12, another can have 15. We had the same gene in different flavors. So that what we learn, I mean, from the studies that people have conducted is that evolution in normal subject keeps pushing toward more CAG. So probably none of us is nine, at least I hope. No? Uh, so the, there are a, a lot of people that have a high number of CAG repeats within the normal range. And, and this is another important message, you know, there is a very important, there is an interesting paper that was published in 2011 uh, by a German group. They are clinicians. They have analyzed, they have conducted MRI scan on 300 normal subjects. And uh, to summarize the message from their work, the message is the following one. The people, so they found that the people that have 
more CAG repeats in the normal range are also the people based on their MRI scan that have more gray matter. So more CAG repeats in the normal range maybe means, I don't know, more neurons, more circuitries. I don't know whether it means more intelligence. Maybe it means be, being more friendly or being more social but, but, uh, uh, or more funny or I don't know. <laughs> no? uh, but uh, I, I, I think that this is telling us something. And uh, so, you know, this is a good trait. And, uh, it, uh, and there is, I mean, more brain. I mean, if you have more CAG repeat. But probably, I mean, in the disease state, our neurons are not able to cope with this exp with larger CAG repeat. And instead of using them uh, 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 to obtain a benefit, of course, I mean, if you are not able, I mean, to cope with this uh, uh, growing CAG repeats, then you have the disease. So we just have to exercise our neurons, I mean, to take advantage of larger CAG repeats. It's, uh, it's really fascinating stuff. We have to, I think we have to leave it there, Eleanor. Um, as a, as this a, is a protein that keeps on surprising us. And as a slight aside, uh, but something that's important to us, we wanted to highlight as she leaves uh, Eleanor's recent appointment as a life senator in her native Italy. In fact, I think only the third woman ever to be appointed, yes? So, I mean, uh, the fight against Huntington's disease is not only a scientific wa but war, but a, a war of, of human rights. And Ellen is really at the forefront of that. And I think as she returns to her uh, seat, we should uh, recognize her. Thank you, Ellen. And as we say in the UK in the 1970s, and now for something completely different. <laughs> Um, we, uh, as you probably know, we at HD Buzz are pretty keen on a concept which I like to refer to as scientainment. Horrible. Okay, not everyone is so keen on the phrase, on the word scientainment. Um, what we are, what we're going to do is we're going to have a special quiz feature. Um, the, the idea is to highlight the, the work of young researchers and the mentorship that senior researchers offer. We are calling the feature The Generation Game. Should we roll the music? Sure. Tonight's contestants are both joining us from beautiful Vancouver, Canada. Uh, first up is Professor, now full professor, Blair Levitt, as an HD physician researcher at the Center for Molecular Medicine and Therapeutics. Blair? Professor Levitt? His opponent is his own uh, graduate student, Michelle Muller. Michelle. Michelle Muller, ladies and gentlemen. Remember, it might seem trivial, but there is a hat at stake. So high stakes game indeed. Stay standing. Let's do oh, clipboards. This. There we go. So grab one of these clipboards each. You'll have to share a microphone. So we're going to ask a series of science questions and then a series of questions on general knowledge, what could loosely be described as general knowledge. Um, who's going first? So the, the first section is the science quiz. You start, Jeff. Uh, so whoever gets uh, cl the closest to the right answer uh, wins the point. So just write your answers down, no cheating, no looking, uh, right, down on your, uh, on your board, and then uh, we'll reveal the correct answer. So make sure you can't see one another's boards, no cheating. Question one, the protein that causes uh, Huntington's disease is one of the biggest that our cells produce. And proteins, all proteins are comprised of little building blocks called amino acids. Uh, so how many amino acids are there in the human Huntington protein? Write down your best guess. No? <laughs> you can't see through the back of his board, Michelle. All right, remember, whoever gets closest is going to win. You got your answer down? Everyone's right. written something. Okay, the correct answer is, of course, 3,144. Blair? Oh! Michelle, Michelle? Bang on the money there. Michelle gets a point. 3,144. Round of applause. What'd you get, Blair? And Professor Blair Levitt, show the nice ladies and gentlemen what you've written. 3,108. Off. Oh. Uh, 26. 
or something. But anyway, we have no mechanism. Very, very far from the mark. We have no mechanism for keeping score. Megan or Charles, can one of you keep score? Uh, a point for uh, Michelle. Okay. Question two. We, uh, you may recognize this chap. This is George Huntington. Of course, he uh, produced the first major description of Huntington's disease in the medical literature. In what year did he write his seminal paper? Or in what year was it published? All right, you got it. Okay. Blair, can we see your shameful attempt? 1846. The answer, of course, is 1872. 1872, Professor Levitt. Michelle? Michelle wrote 1932. So maybe, I guess, if we add them up and take the average between them, they'll have some idea. You know what? It's a damn good job that we have Google, right? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, the future of science. So this year marks the uh, 20th anniversary of the cloning of the gene that causes Huntington's disease after an unprecedented global collaboration. How many scientists were listed in the cell paper that announced the discovery? So a lot of scientists worked on this. We'll give a point to whoever's closest here, I think. Just order of magnitude. All right, Blair, Blair what, what do you got? Written? 54. And Michelle? 15 to 25. I don't think a range was an option, but the answer was 59. Dr. 59 Levitt, a point. 59 individual researchers. Point for Dr. Levitt. Okay. Next science question. I've waxed lyrical about my idea that science is cumulative, that each piece of work is a beautiful snowflake that lands, and together we discover stuff. As an example of that, again, this is the closest gets the point. How many papers according to PubMed, have been published in the past 12 months relating to Huntington's disease. And the noises from the audience suggest that that is a devilishly fine question. <laughs> How many papers on Huntington's disease in the past year? Professor Levitt, you look like you have an answer. 120. And Michelle, 175. The correct answer, in fact, 797. Oh, oh, 120 of those are Blair's papers, of course. All right. Uh, no comment. Now we're moving into uh, the science spelling bee portion of the quiz. Michelle, ironically, uh, your word is phosphodiesterase. No, no, you have so, to do this into the mic. No, no, she can write it down. Phosphodiesterase. Off you go. P H O S P H O D I E S T E R A S E. Is the right answer. Correct. There it is. Those right. are the enzymes that we were talking about that uh, poor old Michelle. Nacho was working on. Blair, your word is heteroscedasticity. Oh! <laughs> Are you a speed reader? <laughs> One for the blooper reel there, the ever expanding blooper reel. Heteroscedasticity. Neither of us has any idea what it means, but we know you know. He concedes the point. I concede I the point. Oh, right. he concedes the point. He hasn't got a clue, even though we showed him the right answer. There's the answer. We won't spell it out to you, but um, there's a lot of S's and there's a K in there and some H's. Okay. Now we're moving on to the general knowledge section of the quiz. And the first question uh, is about Rio. These are individual questions now. So only one of you gets to answer each question. The first question is, we're in Brazil, of course, for the World Congress. Is the president of Brazil male or female? Male? <laughs> oh, so close. <laughs> so close. <laughs> Blair, your question is... The president is, is, in fact, female. And here she is. What is the... Blair, your question is, what is the name of the president of Brazil? Female? <laughs> yes. The name of the female president of Brazil is... The right... <laughs> He's got nothing. It is, of course, Dilma, Dilma Rousseff. Rousseff. Right, guys? We knew that. Okay, so uh, no points to anyone there. Next, there's another Brazil-related question. Uh, 
you may uh, you may be familiar with this statue that uh, towers above Rio, but what figure is depicted in the statue? Jesus. <laughs> That's right. It's Jesus Christ, the statue, Christ the Redeemer. Blair, your question on a related topic: How was the Christ the Redeemer statue funded when it was being designed and built? Come on, Blair, this is basic. This is basic knowledge. Through taxes? Through taxes. No, I'm afraid not. That's the wrong answer. So uh, a point to Michelle only there. Uh, it was, in fact, funded by donations from Brazilian Catholics. I don't know how many a Brazilian Catholics is, but it sure sounds like a lot. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry about that. The final general knowledge question, starting with you, Michelle. Uh, this is Miley Cyrus, as we all know. Um, she, she recently appeared at the VMA Awards, but what dance did she famously do? Twerking. That's right, she twerked. Point to A Michelle. Point for the young person there. And Blair, on a related subject, for one point, please perform a twerk. <laughs> do you concede the point, sir? No, no, I think, I think you should give it a go. <laughs> Stand back, everybody. This could go badly wrong. Oh, he can seize the point. Okay, like he was scorekeeper, go how did we do? Michelle is the winner. She wins the hat. Good luck getting your next paper through Blair's review process. Okay, well done, everyone. Thank you, guys. Thanks for being sports. Okie doke. So we're moving into the home straight here. Um, our final section uh, is brought to you by an old friend of mine and Jeff's and a friend of all of yours as well. Um, we're delighted to welcome him as an honorary contributor to Basilia 2013. He is the man who puts A-list into journalist. He is the man who puts asthmatic into charismatic. He's the man... He's the man who puts the ass into newscaster. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Charles Sabine. Where do you want to see? Jeffrey? I I don't want to be lonely. Okay. Would, would you like me here or? I'm not, tw I'm not twerking at all, okay. <laughs> oh, you know, what are they like, eh? They're genetically entwined, you know, like some monstrous sort of hybrid of showmanship, like half meatloaf and half Liberace. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, it's a great pleasure to be invited up here by the young people. Um, Come on at the end, they said to me, checking that my hearing aid was on. Uh, you know, not too much. Uh, in fact, what you'll actually be doing is telling them about Rio. Not too long, of course, just a few minutes. So here I am. So, I'm not going to tell you stuff about Rio, but just to show that there's some life in the old dog yet, I am going to tell you stuff about Rio whilst at the same time giving a simultaneous lesson in scientific fundamentals. Okay, so here we go. Stir for us, first slide, please. Okay, there we are, Rio de Janeiro, where we are. Now, Rio de Janeiro is Portuguese for River of January. Now, why is that the case? Well, I'll tell you. It's because an explorer called Caspar de Limos left Portugal and arrived there in the January following the, uh, the 1501 when he left Portugal. Now, instead of giving his family a place in history by uh, naming the place after his own name, he uh, used a startling amount of imagination and named it after the month that he arrived. Now, he was probably quite lucky that he did that. 
because uh, that he didn't attach his name to the place because there was a fundamental mistake that this explorer made in calling this place River of January. And I want to see if any of you can notice what that is. Someone got it. There's no river. The port, the bay was so huge that he assumed that there had to be a river there. So called it the River of January. And there's no river. So the first lesson in science is never assume, verify. No. Okay, next, the Brazilian flag. Why, why does it look like this? Well, the green and yellow bits will go back to ancient history and the families of, of Brazil centuries ago. Order and progress are the words. Very fine sentiments there. And then we get to these stars. Now, what is the story about those stars? Well, that was the constellation of the stars that was showing uh, uh, over Rio de Janeiro on the very night that the uh, Portuguese constitution and proclamation of the Republic was made, which, of course, you all know was November the 15th, 1889. Now, well, you know, when I watch my five-year-old uh, drawing the flag of my country, of the United Kingdom, which is quite a tricky one, actually, believe it or not. I kind of often think, you know what? There should be a rule about flags that a five-year-old should be able to draw them, right? You know, so hence the uh, Italian kids and the French kids, easy peasy, as my uh, daughter would say. Lemon squeezy, in fact, she would add. Uh, now this one, however... <laughs> You have to think that a five-year-old would have to be damn smart to get that mother, eh? But so the next lesson is when you're going to portray science to the, to the public, do it as simply as possible. So next scientific lesson, please. Here we have, we've already seen this magnificent, wonderful, iconic view of Rio de Janeiro with this extraordinary statue of Christ the Redeemer. It's 30 meters high, 28 meters across from fingertip to fingertip. My American friends, that's 98 feet and 92 feet respectively. It was built in the course of the 1920s, which makes it of course an Art Deco monument. It is the biggest Art Deco monument in the world and was, until three years ago, the biggest statue of Christ until someone in Poland built a bigger one, which was a bit weird because the guy who designed this one in the first place was Polish as well. It's a bit spooky, all of that. But the point about this that brings me on to my third scientific lesson was that in October of 1931, the statue was going to be opened with a huge battery of lights that were going to light it up in its magnificence across the city so it would be seen from every point in the city. And the person that was going to do that was, of course, the famous scientist Marconi, who had just at that time um, began to make his progress with the uh, rates with with what did, what did what did Marconi do that he could make this work? Come on, scientists, radio <laughs> waves. That's what it was. Radio waves from five thousand seven hundred kilometers away in Rome. He was going to switch these lights on, and this beautiful monument was going to light up. Unfortunately, there was a terrible storm that night, and the the, the whole thing didn't work, and so a junior electrician from Rio ended up switching on these lights, which just goes to show you that just when you're at the point of showing to the public a great scientific advance, something that you never expected comes along and <laughs> the whole thing out. <laughs> you can't beep, right? <laughs> so, no, go, go back, go back. We haven't finished with this. So now moving, while we've got this 
wonderful thing here. I'm going to tell you a little bit about how you might want to go up and see that, because I'm going to have to refer to my notes here, because I won't be able to tell this from memory. If you do want to go and see the Christ the Redeemer, uh, the way that you do it is that there's a tram that goes up uh, every 30 minutes, which costs uh, 48 ray ice, um, and you can book it online you can, if you want to book it on a time basis, if you want to have a specific time. And, or you can just go along and pay two ray ice less, less if you just go along and don't book it online. Um, it is uh, uh, a cab ride, which is about 40 uh, reais to get to from here, from here at this hotel uh, to the tram ride, which takes about 20 minutes. And the statue, you might want to know, is open from 8 in the morning to 8 in the evening. So you could go whilst this conference is on, on and that's relevant when I come on to the weather forecast. There is a... Uh, big music festival here called uh, Rock in Rio going on all week and um, tonight a stellar lineup of people playing tonight including Justin Timberlake and Alicia Keys um, which is of no use at all to you because it's sold out anyway so you can't go uh, which in itself doesn't matter because tonight is the much more fun opening ceremony and welcome function at 7 p.m. Well, probably not at 7 p.m. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is happening in what I, the Sheraton in uh, what can only be described as the, the, the spirit of that great <laughs> uh, explorer uh, who discovered Rio de Janeiro in great imagination. That room, which has a beautiful view of Ipanema Bay, which they call Room One, <laughs> uh, that actually is the room out there, basically. <laughs> so that is where your uh, party is tonight, it's pretty much as soon as this is over. So I will hurry up, I promise. Uh, now, that's that weather. Let's have a look. Tonight and tomorrow, it's going to be nice. So that is significant because... I have to point out that uh, later on in the week, uh, the forecast is not nearly so good. However, I have been informed that weather forecasts in Rio de Janeiro are generally crap, so I wouldn't worry too much about that. Uh, so it's been delightful to be up here tonight, and I'm going to leave you with the words of Franklin D. Roosevelt, who, if you've heard... Senator, Caten Senator Cataneo, how, it's nice, how nice it is to say that. The words of Senator Canate Cataneo today, if um, you've heard the word, those words, you will know that uh, Franklin Roosevelt must have had a very high CAG repeat. Uh, and he said these words that might, might take us through the next few days. Um, we have always held to the hope, the belief, and the conviction that there is a better life, a better world beyond the horizon. Thanks very much, and I'll see you tomorrow. I never knew that we were going to need a tape delay for your, uh, your, your talk there, Charles. <laughs> Uh, we want to thank everybody for participating in a little experiment. Sorry about our technical challenges. Thanks for sticking out with us, and we'll see you here again tomorrow, same time. Good night, everybody. Good night.